Time Report. I'm Sonal Bhutra and with me is Mangalam Malu. It's a fresh new week of trade and today we are coming up with some soft cues. Uh, as far as the Nifty is concerned, we are sitting with cuts of 44 points. It has recovered a tad bit from the lows, but still the larger texture is that of the uh, weakness in the uh, in the benchmark indices. The mid-cap side of things, they continue to do well. So that index is up two tenths of percent. Now remember, mid-cap uh, has been an outperformer last week as well. And today as well, it's starting the week at least on a firmer note. Let's see whether that continues or not because the big cue definitely will be the RBI policy. We'll have to see whether all of it or most of it is, uh, you know, seen in the market moves already or not. Yes, it is. It's a fresh new week, but it's the same old range that we're working with. Uh, last week was a good one as the Nifty scaled new heights. But, you know, for all it's worth, the Nifty ended just about a percent higher. And now today as well, we are seeing the market meander around that bit of a range. But the good part is that over the last couple of trading sessions, we've seen the mid-cap index do much better. So we will monitor cues as they thin out towards the end of this year itself. Uh, let's talk about individual stocks. Let's talk about PG Electroplast. Uh, as we're winding down on the year, let's take a look at some of these stocks which are buzzing around 70% higher in the last one year. The company, remember, is a contract manufacturer of plastic molded components and in consumer electric as well as printed circuit boards too. They're also a beneficiary coming in from uh, the PLI scheme in room ACs. The stock a big mover last year but also today has been buzzing around. Uh, what's the business momentum of the company looking like? We do have with us uh, Vikas Gupta who's the executive director at the company joining us. Vikas, uh, always a pleasure speaking with you. You did uh, uh, you know harp upon that 1800 crore revenue target for this year with about 7% margins so to say. Uh, just wanted to know uh, an update on that. But more importantly, in the AC business itself, which is likely to be a growth driver for you, it is now the time where people will start stocking up for summer. So what's the outlook there? The previous quarter, you crossed about 250 crores in terms of quarterly revenues. Uh, your thoughts here? Yeah, so good afternoon and Mangalam, and uh, thanks for having me again. Uh, regarding air conditioners, uh, uh, as you have rightly pointed out, uh, we are already in the middle of... Uh, uh, ramping up our production. In fact, we are uh, just peaking out, and I think in next uh, one and a half, two months, we'll be peaking at our production levels. And we have already, uh, as you pointed out, we have already done a uh, revenue of around 250 crores uh, in the first quarter. This year, we are uh, uh, shared a guidance that in air conditions, we should be able to do a revenue of almost around 700 to 800 crores. And we are sticking to that uh, guidance. Uh, uh, the kind of order book that we have with us, we are confident that we should be able to, to have a, a, a revenue of almost 800 crores coming from air conditioners alone. And what is the current capacity utilization in ACs, Mr. Gupta? And at peak utilization, what kind of revenues do you see here? So, uh, please understand, Sonal, uh, in, in case of air conditioners, the uh, business is very seasonal. Uh, if you look at the monthly capacity, uh, currently we have undertaken a capacity expansion in uh, in our AC product category. We are now currently about, we are sitting with a capacity of almost around 200,000 indoor units and almost 100,000 outdoor units. Mm. But that is a monthly uh, capacity, okay? Mm. But when we look at the annualized production, we are targeting a production of almost around 700 to 800,000 uh, of uh, ODUs and mm. almost a million uh, IDUs uh, in, in this year. Okay, and uh, what about the market share? At the end of the last year, it was closer to around that, just below that 4% mark. This year, with your capacity increasing, one presumes your market share will increase as well. What are you targeting? So, uh, market share, exact number is very difficult for me to give you right now, but uh, we are targeting a, uh, at least 2x or 3x growth in, uh, at least a 3x growth in our, in, in our AC business. And last year, FI22, we did almost 300 crores of business. And this year, we are targeting 750 to 800 crores of business in AC. So, the market share will accordingly be uh, up. Okay. So, we'll uh, watch out for that market share number in this year. Uh, I wanted to understand in terms of raw material costs, we are talking about raw material costs cooling off from the highs this quarter. Uh, has it been passed on to the clients or you will re retain that and that will help in margin improvement? 7% EBITDA margin target for FY23, does it stay or does it improve? So we are still maintaining the guidance of 7% 7, uh, 7 of EBITDA margin uh, for the current uh, FI23. Definitely the uh, commodity prices have short-termed up. 
but uh, actually to remain competitive in the market we need to pass on uh, that uh, commodity uh, uh, revisions to our clients and uh, so uh, we will be more than happy to retain some part of that with us but somehow we need to look at the dynamics of the market and how the competitive landscape is operating based on that we have to uh, uh, pass on the commodity uh, benefit to the client as well you know ac is one part of your business you were also pretty bullish on the way washing machines would pan out for you just wanted to understand uh, what's uh, the share of revenue from washing machine what it's likely to be and while you talk about that uh, you alluded to competitive pressures etc i just wanted to understand what is your moat around this business primarily because you know for acs we do have a lot of ac component ma- manufacturers uh, there are other listed players who do washing machines etc as well so this is no you know a uh, uh, low entry barrier sort of business the biggest entry barrier is the clients that you have in this business and the production capacity that you have apart from that is there anything extra that you give to clients that keep them sticky so no please understand uh, when we talk about uh, ac definitely the competitive landscape is uh, very tough and uh, we are a pretty new player in ac uh, business we started doing a odm category of business only in last summer summer of uh, 2022 so and we launched our odm uh, uh, category of ac business uh, last year only so we were sitting on a very small base a very small base so uh, we have a very strong uh, uh, i would say uh, Uh, relationship going forward with all these clients and uh, the kind of commitment that we have made in PLI scheme also so we are confident that we should be able to maintain that momentum in AC business and regarding washing machine as well uh, we have done a decent number last year we did almost around 160 crores of business in uh, washing machine uh, this year uh, we should be able to close almost around 270 to 280 crores in in washing machine in the first half year itself only in washing machine we had done almost around 150 crores of uh, revenue from washing machine alone so coming back to the retentions of the client uh, it is basically the quality cost and delivery these are the three buzzwords three mantras for us to maintain our uh, relationship and to remain uh, 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 to maintain a long term relation with the client Okay, uh, got that point. So, in term, this is about your AC business, your Washington, uh, wa- sorry, washing machine segment as well. I wanted to understand your expansion plans into businesses like sanitary ware, the ceiling fan business. What kind of capex are you putting in here? What is the revenue potential here? And uh, when does it start showing uh, massively in your books? So, uh, looking at uh, ceiling fans and sanitary ware business, uh, definitely uh, they are very promising. They are growing. Currently, they are uh, at a very small percentage, maybe around uh, uh, around ten uh, percent of our overall revenue. But we are seeing a very strong uh, momentum in that also because there are a lot of clients who are working with us. They were earlier doing imports from China and other countries. They are also looking at localizing all those uh, products, all those components. So. we are seeing a very strong uh, 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 demand in that and we are already expanded our capacity in sanitary ware uh, and we are uh, like added up a, a new client also recently in our sanitary business a large uh, mnc marquee brand we have added in sanitary ware so we are confident of uh, bring it to a level of almost around 15% to 20% of our revenue in next 2 uh, to 3 years all right that will be 15 to 20% of your revenue in the next 2 to 3 years final question then uh, This is with regards to your inventory days. It is uh, well over 115. When does it come down? What is the normalized level that one should be working with? And secondly, you know, on your revenue mix itself, uh, how does your revenue mix pan out? Say two years from now, once you have you know more contribution coming in from sanitary, where ACs will be on full blast. You have washing machine, and then you have your plastic business, which is already on. So, what does the revenue mix of the company look like? so uh, plastic molding which was almost around 57% of our revenue last year will be close to less than 40% uh, this year as our focus is more on growing our uh, product business and, uh, and and i think in next 2 uh, to 3 years uh, the product business it will contribute almost uh, almost 75 to 80% of our overall revenue the main growth drivers will remain ac uh, uh, wash machines and uh, 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 televisions is also one category that we are into now so uh, 
In AC alone, we should be like, as I told you earlier, also in PLI scheme, we have committed a reven uh, revenue of almost around 1,500 crores, cumulative revenue over a period of five years, which will translate into a revenue of almost around 3,000 crores uh, in, in next five years. So, so AC alone will be contributing almost around 2,500 to 2,000 crores, and uh, washing machine should be almost around 500 to 600 crores uh, in coming one and a half to two years. So. That way, uh, the overall product business will be almost around 80% of our revenue. Okay. All right, Mr. Gupta, thank you so much for joining us, giving us all those details. And those are the plans with uh, PG Electroplast in coming quarters, so to say. The stock is up around 4%, has been a big outperformer this year as well. Uh, let's do one thing. Let's slip into a short break. On the other side, we'll put focus on DFM Foods and some financial stocks that are reacting to news updates and a lot more. Stay tuned. Um, uh, stocks which are buzzing around right now. At the high point of trade is Tata Consumer. Remember, all of last week, it was a little volatile. There was news about a big impending acquisition, etc. Asian Paints is the other one which is doing well, and that's uh, counterintuitive given the rise that we've seen in crude prices over the last couple of trading sessions. But despite that, we're seeing a bit of an up move out there. But in the consumer space itself, we have DFM Foods, which is uh, buzzing around, and this despite the company receiving an order from uh, the DGGST. What is uh, uh, the claim of the DGGST? They're saying that the company has been misclassifying its products, and as a result of which, they're paying less GST than they're supposed to. And as a result of which, the differential that they're supposed to pay is close to around 101 odd crore rupees. And on top of that, there has been a 101 crore penalty which has been levied. But on its part, the company says that they don't expect any financial implication basis advice from their advocates and that they're not misclassifying that. In fact, they've gone ahead and suggested that they will appeal against this order itself. So as a result of which, we aren't seeing a big downtick on the stock already. But remember, the other trigger for the stock, of course, is the voluntary delisting that was announced at a revised offer price of around 264 odd rupees. And as a stock itself, you know, DFM Foods hasn't moved virtually in the last five years or so. Today, the stock is up 1.3%. If you looked at it, uh, you know, the last five years, the stock has seen volatile runs, but point to point comparison, it's up just around one odd percent. So today's move and the GST thing has not much to do with it as, uh, uh, you know, the voluntary delisting has uh, with uh, DFM Foods. Okay, so that is the update on DFM Foods, the stock up around one and a half percent. But the other stock that is doing well is M&M Financial. It is on our radar on the back of their November business update. Abhishek Kothari is joining us with all those details. Abhishek. Uh, well, to begin with, you know, uh, the November business update of m and Finance uh, did mention that they had a monthly disbursals of 4,500 crore, which is a decline of more than 14% on a month-on-month -month basis. So in last seven quarters, this is the highest rate of decline that you are seeing. But on the positive side, the collection efficiency was robust, coming in at 96% when compared to 91% in the previous month. The cross NPA ratio has remained stable at around 7% level for November when compared to 7% in October and this compares to about 6.7% for the month of September. In that, the uh, stage 2 or the loans due between 60 days to 90 days has actually seen an improvement on month-on-month -on -month basis. So analysts remain bullish on the stock. CLSA has written a note on m, &M Finance. They have a buy recommendation and a target price of 260 per share. They say that the dispersal tractions remain healthy and collections were strong. The stage 2 has improved with stage three uh, loans remaining stable. So management expects both to improve in the month of December or by Q3 FI23 due to seasonality. The only negative surprise which uh, CLSA mentioned is could be on the net interest margin or on the operating expenses side. Morgan Stanley has also written a note on m and Finance with an overweight rating and a target price of 275 per share. They say that disbursals and collections have remained strong in November aided by the fact that there were macro tailwinds which the management has highlighted. So collection efficiency in the month of November rose both month on month and year on year. And with, uh, you know, asset quality remaining stable, they remain positive on the stock. Back to you. All right, Abhishek, thanks a lot for that. That's about M&M Financial up 6%. But uh, you've also uh, got a Morgan Stanley note which has initiated coverage on gold finance companies. 
Uh, well, as you mentioned, you know, Morgan Stanley has initiated on Manapuram as well as Mutut Finance. So for Manapuram, they have an overweight rating with a target price of 150 per share, which is an uh, you know increase of about 25.6% compared to Friday's closing price. And they have initiated on Mutut Finance with an equal weight rating, a target price of 1,150, which is an upside of 1.25% compared to Friday's uh, closing price. They say that gold lending business has been uh, very good with a uh, super normal ROE but low growth given the fact that there is competition from the banks. So diversification is the way out. Manapuram looks better positioned than Mutut Finance uh, due to uh, cyclicality and uh, structurally. They believe that valuation multiples are also uh, you know, attractive for Manapuram. Back to you. All right, that is all the update from the financial space. Uh, let's talk about some other names now. The other stock on our radar is uh, Angel One. It is on the back of their business update. Surbi is joining us with all those details. Surbi. Angel One has released their November business update and it's a weak set of numbers. Their gross client acquisition was down in third consecutive month. It was down 6% on a month-on-month -month basis. Their number of orders were marginally up, but this is mainly because there were higher number of trading days this month compared to the previous. They, they have seen a significant drop in the client funding book as well. Their client funding book was down 18% on a month-on-month -month basis at 1292 crores versus 1575 crores in the previous month. It has lost market shares across all segments, FNO, equity, cash and commodity. First time in seven months, it has lost market share in the commodity segment. It is down 210 basis points at 51.3% versus 53.4% in the previous month. Point, uh, Surabhi, thanks a lot for that. Meanwhile, just take a short break, come back on the other side. We get chatting with Ruchi Jain to bring in some trading strategies as well. The market's picking some pace this afternoon. CNBC TV 18, there's a mild recovery from the lows. The Nifty is down just 20 points. We started the show, it was down around 40 odd points. And we have a couple of these names which are at the day's high. So, something like an NTPC should come up for you on the screen. Uh, not a big contributor to Nifty moves, but still, that stock is at the day's high. SBI is the other one which is uh, actually contributing for, uh, to the gains that we are seeing from the low. So that stock should also come up for you. Hindalco, Tata Consumer, Asian Pains, some of these consumer names too are seeing some uh, buying from the lows of the day. And that is something that is reflecting in the Nifty moves as well. Just 16 points uh, for the Nifty to be in the green. So let's see whether we actually see some green on the Nifty today or not. But that is uh, around the levels. So, but uh, Mangalam, we'll discuss the FNO part of things as well. What is the setup looking like right now? Yes, it is that time of the day where we talk about the FNO space and how it's shaping up at midday and as we speak you know a couple of things are really standing out uh, the call writers are still pretty active because if it being a slightly softish day we have seen call writers at 18,700 as well as 18,800 both of them hold their fort so 18,700 call has seen almost 40 lakh shares being written for about a premium of 105 and 18,800 call that one too should come up for you we still have around 20 lakh shares so between 18,700 and 18,800 we do have about 50, 60 lakh shares for a premium of anywhere between 50 to 100 odd rupees. And this after a day when on Friday as well, the FIS wrote almost 1.73 lakh calls on Friday. So that's telling you that, you know, levels upwards of 18,750, if the Nifty was to go, there could be some sort of congestion. And that ties in with the way we've seen, uh, you know, global markets as well. They have been consolidating, even though they are recovering from lows, etc., so that is something we'll be monitoring. But were we to hold above these levels of 18,700, 18,750? In fact, as we speak, it's poetic that the Nifty has gone ahead and crossed that 18,700 mark. And with gusto, it's moved into the green. If we do go ahead and hold on to these levels, we will see a fair amount of short covering. And that is something which will take place by virtue of the kind of shots that we've seen in these calls. And as we see these calls being written and unwinding out there if the market sustains, we aren't seeing the bulls let up on lower levels. 18,650 put as well as 18,600 put are extremely active in today's trading session. So the premium out there suggests that, you know, we could see support around that 18,550 to 18,600 mark. And that's actually the level from where the Nifty bounced back as well. As we speak, it is being a big, big up move uh, yeah. from the lows. In fact, the Nifty is at that 18,705 mark. It has... Uh, Nifty Bank for company, which has uh, taken it higher alongside the stocks that you mentioned. But just keep an eye out on Reliance. Reliance is a hefty weight on the index. While it is still in the red, it has moved significantly off lows. In fact, Reliance 
from the lows has moved virtually towards the high point of today's trading session. Mm -hmm. Not in the green yet, but is supporting the cause of the Nifty holding around that 18,700 mark. Yes, a massive move that we are seeing on the Nifty right now. So it's a good time to get a technical check on the market. So Ruchit Jain of FivePesa.com is joining us now. Ruchit, uh, there's a sharp recovery from the lows. Nifty is in the green as we speak. Of course, it is up just seven points, but that's a massive move, right? So what are the charts suggesting? Will we uh, stay at those levels? Is there some more moves that we are expecting from these levels? Yes, hi, very good afternoon. Well, if you look at the recent move, then the markets, although are trading uh, no, quite close to the all-time high, but uh, no, the index has already moved from, say, 16,800 level. So from 16,800 to 18,800, it's been a 2,000-point rally where we have not seen any significant price-wise correction. So the momentum readings have entered a bit overbought zone. And generally, whenever we see such overbought setups, markets either tend to show a price-wise correction or a time-wise correction. Now, looking at the broader markets, the broader markets have recently started gaining up momentum and showing a catch-up move. Also, the external data remains positive. Where US markets are holding on to their gains. The dollar index remains at current uh, at lower levels of 104, 105, which is positive for the equities. And even FIS positions in the index futures are still around 65%, although they have uh, no, uh, lowered, uh, they have trimmed some of the positions on Friday, but still a 65 percent long side remains still uh, is a bullish data. So we believe that this market would show more of a time-wise correction for next few trading sessions. Options data indicates 18600 to 18800 being a 200 point range where the market could consolidate. And within this time-wise corrective phase, we could see some stock specific action on the positive side getting continued. So it's not a, uh, it's not a, it's not a, a corrective phase where we would see some major price-wise correction. When the Nifty comes near 18600, 550 range, you would witness buying interest in those levels. So it's a buy on dip market where one should play the range of 18600 to 18800, buy close to 18600 as much as possible, so that the risk reward ratio would favorable uh, become favorable on the index trades there. All right, we take that point, Richie. Thank you. Uh, individual stocks. What do you have on your list today? Uh, yeah, Mangalam, I have a couple of buy recommendations going with the trend of the broader markets. Firstly, I think the real estate space in the month of December could do quite well uh, since we have seen a falling trend line breakout on the real Nifty Realty Index. And DLF, of, of course, being a heavyweight and taking the leadership, I think uh, no, for the month of December, we could see some good momentum in DLF from current levels. So go long on DLF. Since we have a breakout with good volumes, keep a stock below 404 for potential targets around 434 in the near term. And within the banking space, we can see some clear end of outperformance from some mid-cap banks. So City Union Bank would be the other stock uh, which I have buy recommendation on. Uh, we witnessed a price up move with good volumes, then some time-wise correction or consolidation, and now the, again uh, the broader uptrend is getting resumed. So City Union Bank looks good for potential target around 210. One can go along with stop loss below 191. All right, Richard, thanks a lot for joining us, taking us through what the market moves look like and individual names as well. Let's do one thing. Let's slip into a short break. On the other side, in our special segment, Unusual Movers, we'll put focus on CR after and report on CNBC TV 18. We're 15 points higher on the Nifty and a lot of stocks which are contributing to that momentum that we are seeing right now. Let's see whether we continue this momentum or not and Nifty uh, stays in the green for today or not. But for now, we are focusing on individual stocks and it's time for our special segment, Unusual Mover. Today Surbi is focusing on CRM silk mills, which is buzzing in trade and it is up around 7% today. Uh, Surbi, tell us what's happening here. Hi, thanks for that. Today's unusual mover is CRM silk mills. The stock is up close to 7% uh, in today's trading session on the back of strong volumes as well. In the last five trading sessions, the stock has gained around 11%. In the last week, the delivery quantity was 1.5 times their five week average. We have spotted the stock earlier in the mid-cap spotlight segment on the back of strong Q2 numbers when the revenue growth was 33% and the EBITDA growth was 43% on a year-on-year -year basis. Now let's see how the stock has fared in the last five years. In the last five years, the sales have grown at a 4% CAGR, but the PAT that has grown at a 20% CAGR. The management did mention that it was seeing so strong traction from the export market. It has seen robust growth in realizations due to increased premiumization. Their premium suiting segment that has been consistently performing well and are now contributes 25% of their revenues and it is expected to increase further due to a strong wedding season demand as well. We'll see how the wedding season demand goes for this one. All right, uh, Surabhi, thanks a lot for that. An unusual mover today with a uh, fair amount of volumes as well. Important to see how the third quarter is, but also important to know that the last five-year revenue growth has been just at a 4% CAGR for CRM silk mills. But a whole host of other stocks in focus as well. We have the likes of 
Hats and Agro Ion Exchange, as well as Dilip Bilkol uh, reacting to news. Vahista joins in with more on each of these stocks. Vahista. Hi, Mangalam. Pats. Thanks for that. Let me start with Hats and Agro products, wherein the company is raising uh, 302 crores via the rights issue and where the issue price is capped at 419 rupees per share. The record date for this is 8th of December and the right entitlement ratio is one right equity share for every 30 shares which are held by the shareholders. Moving on to Ion Exchange, wherein the company has been awarded a contract by Indian Oil Corporation. This is for designing, engineering, manufacturing, supply, commissioning, operation and maintenance. This is for a period of five years of zero liquid discharge plant at their Panipat refinery. The contract value is at approximately 350 crores and the project is to be commissioned within 16 months. Moving on to Dilip Bilkon, which has executed a contract agreement with the Gujarat Metro Rail Corporation and this is for the construction of Corridor 2 of the Phase 1 of the Surat Metro Rail project. The project cost is at approximately 700 crores. Back to you. All right. All those stocks in focus today. Vaishta, thank you so much for bringing up to speed with those names. Uh, it's time to slip into a break now. On the other side, we'll focus on uh, tech stocks reacting in trade today to a lot of news updates as well. Stay tuned. Holding between the green and the red for the Nifty right now, the Sensex has just moved mildly into the red, but we're as close to the flat line as we can be right now. That still is a win for the bulls because we have seen a bit of a recovery. So let's see how that goes from here. The stocks which are doing well are uh, the ones which have been doing well all through this morning. We have Tata Steel, which has only extended its gains, as has JSW Steel. And over the last uh, you know few minutes, we've seen a bit of a spike come by in Infosys as well. The IT pack is... Uh, doing better now than it did at the start of today's trading session so the intraday chart of infosys comes up for you that has moved into the green and towards the high point of trade so let's get in some market opinion from uh, market masters earlier today we caught up with gotham trivedi of napian capital to understand his outlook especially on the emerging markets and india in specific <coughs> let's hear him out msci asia x japan uh, it saw a 17% rally. It's the second highest in the history that you've seen a single month rally uh, of as much as 17%. Uh, of course, a lot of that was propelled by uh, $8.5 billion of foreign buying into China. And I think that's what I find as a bit of a concern for our market, given the fact that money invariably ends up uh, flowing from, from higher valuations to valuations which are more attractive. We are still 100%, uh, 100 and, actually 130% uh, at 130% a, at a premium to MSCI China. So I think that risk uh, clearly remains uh, for the Indian market. From a foreign institutional buying perspective, domestic is a separate story. More than half the uh, investors now in the Indian market, given the proliferation of DMAT accounts, uh, have gone up 3x in the last two and a half years. If I look at the absolute amount year to date invested in the Indian market, so FIs are a negative $17 billion. Uh, domestic mutual funds are a positive $33 billion. And if I look at the NSC data that comes out on retail participation in the market, we're roughly about eight or eight and a half billion of retail year to date net. These are all net numbers. So if you add that up, you get about $22 billion of net flows into the Indian equity markets, counting everybody who's participating in it. If another $5 billion inflows or outflows were to come into this market, again, keeping in mind that the, our total market cap is as big as 3.3 trillion, fourth largest in the world, another $5 billion inflows or outflows could have a significant market impact. I still stand by the fact that we are in the middle of a bear market rally. We're not out of the woods. Uh, the other thing, of course, is if you look at the Bloomberg consensus for world GDP growth, uh, it's down from, uh, as in this year, uh, estimates are 2.9 percent, and uh, next year, 2023 calendar, are anywhere from 1.8 to 2 percent. So clearly a slowdown. The question really is how deep does the recession in the U.S. and Europe get to? And nobody has an answer to that. Now, if you look at the MSCI all country world index, the United States accounts for 61 percent in terms of weightage. So that will drag down the rest of the world if a recession were to get deep.
One thing that I must caution all investors uh, is the fact that uh, heading into 2023, which is going to be a very uncertain year, uh, I think valuation uh, protection is really your friend in this in this market. So as a result of that, I would I would say that if you look at the two wheelers, for example, the Bajaj is uh, the Bajaj Auto and uh, Hero, they're both around 15 times FI24 PE. You know, downsides fairly limited. Uh, even Maruti is not that bad actually, 24, 25 times. And uh, Ashok Clarence at about 19 times. So I think these these valuation numbers aren't really aggressive for the automobile sector. Uh, might be a good place to, to stay invested. Having said that, I think the passenger car segment, and unfortunately Maruti is really the only way to play it, um, is very robust in terms of demand, especially the premium and luxury segment. Okay, that is some market opinion coming in, but back to some stock-specific action now. Persistent Systems is on our radar after JP Morgan has downgraded the stock. This comes after JP Morgan had upgraded the stock back in October itself. Nimesh is joining us to tell us what is really driving this downgrade now, Nimesh. So what led to the downgrade is the fact that after that upgrade in, in October, the stock has rallied 31%. Versus the, versus the IT index, which is up only 14%. So there has been a big outperformance on the stock in the last two months since the last upgrade. And now JP Morgan believes after a 31% rally, the stock is fairly valued at 32 times one year forward price to earnings. And, and it is trading at a premium to all the global peers. In fact, uh, the quarter three could be, a, could be a surprise and that's something they'll be watching out for. But in case there is no big surprise in the quarter three earnings, they do not see any positive catalyst uh, you know, that can drive the further re-rating. So uh, after a 31% rally and the stock is very fairly valid now, JP Morgan has got, gone ahead and downgraded the stock again to neutral from overweight and they've written a target price of 4100 on persistent systems. All right, we take that point, Nimesh. Thanks a lot for that. So that's the weakness in persistent systems. But uh, what explains the weakness in LTI, Mindtree shares? It listed on the exchanges today, now available for trading, maybe a bit of a supply. Rima joins in with more details on that one. Rima. Thanks so much for that. So LTI will now be called LTI Mindtree and the ticker instead of being LTI will be LTIM. Now what has changed? Everything about the merger was known. But if you remember the swap ratio told you if you have 100 shares of Mindtree you will get 73 shares of LTI. So now those extra shares of LTI Mindtree will now be available for trading. So if I had Mindtree shares, I will now in my account have those LTI shares post the swap ratio. So the share base has gotten expanded. So that's the only change which has happened. It was not expected to be any big stock price impact because all of it was priced in. What's the merged entity looking like? It's the sixth largest Indian IT company by way of revenues. The annualized revenue run rate, if you annualize the Q2 revenues, should be in excess of $4 billion. It emerges as the fifth largest IT company by market capitalization with a market cap which is closer to 1.5 lakh crores. It overtakes uh, Tech Mahindra as well. The portfolios of the two companies are seen fairly complementary. The company in an interview to us uh, just last month said that the two companies together would have more than 700 clients, but only 10 to 12 of them are overlapping. What's the risk per se? One is expensive valuations, especially, uh, you know, compared to the other large cap peers as well as the mid cap peers. It trades at close to 30 times forward multiple. And some shareholders would be holding LTI as well as Mindtree. Now you're going to be getting a lot more shares of only one entity. So suppose you don't want it. There is always that risk of that excess supply getting sold into the market. Back to you. Take the point, Reema. Thank you so much for that. With that, we'll step into a short break. On the other side, we'll focus on the commodities arena. Manisha Gupta joins in with Jonathan Barrett of Probis Securities. We will be discussing metals. The metals pack is a bust. All of these mid-caps actually are spiking even as the Nifty has just flattened out. Uh, Strides Pharma is up almost 5-odd percent. We have Trent, which has recovered a fair bit from the lows. And Page Industries, too, has recovered from the lows. Currently uh, sitting with a mild gain, but then again from the lows, it has gained about a percent and a half at the high point of trade. But uh, the toast of today's trading session has been the metals pack. And who better than Manisha to tell us uh, about all things commodities and specifically metals. Manisha, what's happening? Take it away. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Absolutely, metals do take it away. It's uh, November was a month. It was the best in 2022 and even before that, for that matter. And December has started on a very positive note yet again. So you are looking at a four-month highs in case of copper and the other metals as well trading on multi-month highs. That's the dollar index on your screen there where we have seen another quarter percent of a decline coming in. So a four-month lows on dollar index clearly has been supportive for many of these dollar-denominated commodities. But let's take it to Jonathan Barat. He's CIO at uh, Probus Securities and he joins us on the show now. Jonathan, while the last week was eventful and what a weekend it has been as all eyes were glued on to Sunday's OPEX meeting on what would they come out with. 
not too much in sense of statement there except that they've kept it absolutely unchanged. So what we are seeing is 2 million barrels per day of a cut that we've seen in November to continue into 2023 as well. Was its OPEC way of waiting on the sidelines, watching out on what really happens with European Union, G7, etc. on Russian sanctions? Yeah, Manisha, uh, good morning. Look, I 100% agree with you there on the sideline waiting. Remember, it is OPEC plus, and we know that plus means Russia. Um, when you look at G7 and EU, what they've done and what they've decided to do on oil, the oil cap at 60 US dollars uh, a barrel, um, plus also the banning of seaborne oil from Russia. I think the key that we're all going to focus on is how will Russia retaliate and also uh, how will this support what OPEC have actually done. So there's a few questions, and I think you're 100% right. OPEC just on the sideline. Let's see what Russia does. Mind you, I don't think it's going to be all that uh, uh, negative, um, but I think, if anything, you might see a little bit of a bump uh, into the top side uh, in the oil price. Oh, well, absolutely. Jonathan, 80% of the global countries import crude and nearly 50 countries import crude from Russia. I mean, in whatever quantities, really. And if, I, you know, I was trying and sitting and doing the maths, 27 countries in European Union and then some G7 and then some add some countries. So that 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 perhaps take you to, takes you to 30, 35 countries there. What's your sense? Mm. I mean, I know it's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, guesswork, but what's your sense on what Russia could do? Look, look, I, 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 I do understand. Just create a lot of noise, um, and, and I think that'll that'll sort of uh, see the market a little bit higher. Remember, Russia continues to receive dollars on sales. Uh, remember, Russia also discounts its price quite heavily, and I think that's where we'll find a little bit of discussion on on the trade cap, um, on the on the cap for the price of oil. Um, I, I think it's really going to be interesting to see what they actually do. But but I don't think that Russia's going to lie down and just do nothing. They're going to turn around, whatever it'll be or whatever they'll do. If anything, I think they'll turn around and the, the retaliation will be to those countries uh, which are supporting the cap in any way. Now, that could be for anything. It could be um, palladium, it could be oil, it could be copper, it okay. could be natural gas, as we know. So, so I think there is a play out there that could see prices for oil have a bit of a test to the top side as a result of what we're seeing, what Russia will do. Oh, absolutely. So what's your sense on how the prices could move the range uh, for the rest of December then? Look, I'll tell you what, I've been quite interested uh, and have been interested in the bounce that we saw, particularly on the uh, Brent and the WTI. We did see that uh, that bounce the other day, and I think that cemented a very important low for us. Um, and, and I think if the market can remain above those those lows, uh, basis uh, 75 on the WTA, uh, WTI, and I think with Brent it was down to that 82.50. Mm. So if it can stay above those levels, then I think we'll have a test to the top side. So I still see it ranging. But I think that we've established the lower end. Uh, let's see how what the higher end will come in. And I probably think WTA, basis WTI, uh, probably see to sort of head back to that uh, 80, 80, $82 a barrel. And that'll obviously see Brent a little bit higher as well. But I don't see it a remarkable movement, but I think it'll be still within the ranges that we've seen. All right. That takes us to metals then. And what a super run up that we've seen coming from, uh, you know, from the kind of lows that we established in 2022. I guess the dollar index has been declining, but would you, would you say the major card really is from China, where we do see COVID restrictions being eased back from these current levels as well? How much of can further play come in from China? How much would you look at in sense of percentage uh, for the US Fed yeah. meeting as well? Look, I, I think but generally speaking, the most important thing there is, is China in the mix, particularly with your base metals. Uh, remember, copper is something that we're really focused on. There is not a lot of supply of copper out there. Um, so let's really see what COVID, if the relaxing of COVID rules in China gives a sense of relief. Remember, we've had some pretty negative numbers out of China recent, recent economic numbers. So, so I think they're feeling the pinch. And if they do open things up a little bit more, then I think that will be supportive of some of our commodities. Yes, the US dollar index is a major factor there. Expect that to remain where it is. But at the moment, I think some of those base metals, particularly that copper, there is risk to the top side on that. And I'm supportive of copper into uh, 2023 uh, moving to the top side. There is not a lot of supply there. If economies pick up, that metal is going to have a run. All right. Apart from copper, are you betting on silver as well? Because what a strong run up on that too. $23 per ounce is back. Oh, look, it's, it's been a great run for silver and for gold. There's no doubt about it. I think gold's sort of been attracted to, obviously, those um, like more of a Russian play in terms of debt and defaulting and and basically being void of interest or US dollar bonds. So I think you're seeing still a lot of central bank buying in the precious metal markets, particularly gold. Yes, you're going to see a weak dollar, but I think you'll find the central banks to those economies or those rogue economies that uh, that the US thinks 
will be worried about losing those interest repayments from the US because those bonds will be void. And as a result of that, they want to shore up their own economies. So I think gold is a major play there. Mm -hmm. All right, Jonathan. Uh, Manisha, thank you so much for uh, joining in and giving us all the updates in the commodities arena. Uh, shifting focus back to the uh, you know equities right now, the Nifty is back below that 18,700 mark. Uh, the stock that took it above that 18,700 mark and the one that took it below 18,700 are the same. It is Reliance. Just pull up the intraday chart of Reliance and you'll see there was a major spike from the lows on uh, the counter and because of its weight on the index, the Nifty moved higher. And uh, while it stayed in the red throughout, it has now uh, you know fallen from the highs that we saw just a few minutes ago as well as a result of which the Nifty back again near that flat line. So that tug of war between call writers at 18,700 and put writers at 18,650 continues for the market. We wrap up on this edition of Halftime Report. You stay tuned. Business Lunch will take all the market action ahead.